What's up? What's up? What's up? It's your boy, Pastor AB, man, and I'm here to talk to you about a subject that most people be asking me about. I just got to touch bases on it, and it's the conversation of God and giving. And so this first little piece of what we'll be going into is one significant question. And a lot of people ask this question, does God want my money? You ever asked that question before? Does God want my money? Well, the answer is very simple, and I'm able to answer this out the gate. No, God does not want your money. What he does want is your heart. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk through this and we're going to give a little background into how God wants your heart and how is your heart and your giving connected. And so the first thing we got to do is dispel some of these myths and some of these thoughts. I know a lot of people have been taught a lot of different things, especially in our, ch our current church culture as it relates to prosperity and the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel has gotten such a horrible name because it seems to be, by def definition, this gospel that only speaks to the uh amplification of financial wealth and the benefits of financial wealth as it relates to the gospel, right? And so first off, I want to let you understand that I do believe in prosperity and that prosperity is a part of the too good to be true news, the true gospel, news. the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that said, how it's been presented to you in nine times out of 10 in our current culture, is wrong. So I feel you. If you if you if you feel a little weary, if you're a little tired of it, if you just ain't having it, if you're like one of those people, it's like, man, I saw this happen all throughout my childhood. I saw my parents struggle. I saw my mom struggle giving into a church and just keep giving and keep giving. And she ain't never seen nothing for it. I saw my grandma go through so many struggles because all she did was talk about giving, giving, giving. And it seems like the pastor was riding around in the caddy and the rest of the family was was riding around in, in a limit. You know, so I can understand it and I can actually relate. The problem is not the, the fact that God wants to bless people and that giving is a part of that blessing. The problem is how it was communicated. And so I just want to dispel these myths right off the bat. God does want giving. He believes in giving, but he doesn't want our money. It's not about our money. It's about our heart. And so we're going to break down things. We're going to talk about this thing in a lot of different angles. I'm going to have a whole uh, discussion on just the tithe and the New Testament idea of what the tithe actually is. I'm going to touch bases on that. I'm going to, I'm going to touch bases on how to effectively give the heart posture that you should have while you're giving. I'm also going to touch bases on the fact of giving as a whole. What does giving look like? Is it just financial or is it time? Is it resources? Is it other things or is it just money? We're going to talk about all of those different dynamics. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the fact of giving versus how we view the receiving aspect of it. There's a difference of giving to receive and just receiving just receiving from God and being blessed by God. And so there's some people who have a certain focus on, I got to give just to get. It's like, I'm putting this out because I expect return. And I'm, I'm going to talk through that and talk through the proper practice of that and the improper pra proper practice of that. I'm also going to talk about where you give because it's very important to know and to recognize where you give. All right. If you're giving into something, you should be able to also reap where you have sown. So we're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about how to give locationally and we're going to talk about how to invest. How do you invest and what does investment look like in the kingdom of God? Because there is a specific investing in the kingdom. OK, so we're going to talk about all of those different things. That's not something that'll be clear in this first piece. This first piece is just going to center around the fact of does God want my money? And so we're going to break that thought process right now. I know everybody has heard this. Right. And this is Malachi chapter three. Will a man rob God? You say, yes. He has robbed me. Where has he robbed me? He has robbed me with tithes and offering. I don't know how many of y'all have ever done this, but I grew up in a church where 
every offering that was raised, that particular scripture was brought up. You could not, I know that scripture by heart because it was indoctrinated. I heard it every single Sunday and Wednesday. Every time they raise an offering, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? I learned that. So if you have ever been close to church, you probably had the same experience where you heard that quite a bit. Will a man rob God? That is the question. Will a man rob God? Well, the funny thing about that question is it puts you on notice. And if you grew up in the type of church that I did, you grew up being worried that if you didn't give into that offering, if you didn't give, if you didn't give your tithes, if you didn't give your offering, that you were actually not just robbing the church, but you were robbing God. And so it's one thing to rob the church, right? It's one thing to rob a structure, a building uh, full of people that you may or may not know. It's a whole different thing to rob the creator of everything, heavens and earth everything, the person that gave you life, the thing that gave you life, that gave you breath, and you're going to rob it. And so think about the guilt that comes along with that. Think about the compulsory that comes along with that. Like, I have to give. Like, I have to do it. There's no way that I can't give it. And so this was drummed into our head. Ooh, you better give. It's a requirement. Well, I want you to understand something. That didn't just happen to us. That's also biblical. So in the Bible, they were taught as a part of the law and the custom that offering was required in order to take care of the sins of the people. So offering was how you gave to God so that your sins would be forgiven. And so that was the part of the process. It was I'm giving in order to receive. And so there were specific requirements. There were specific things that they had to give and they had to give it specifically. Everything was set in a structure and this was what they had to do, period. If they didn't do it, then they were in danger of death. If they didn't do it and somebody knew that they didn't do it, they could get reprimanded for it. They can get stoned for it. That could be something that can be a curse. And what happens is that curse goes to the rest of the community. And so if the community heard about something like that, they would try to hurt or kill the person that was not giving. Because that was an affront against God. Okay. So it's coming from somewhere that was that did have a biblical approach. OK, but the fact of the matter is, is that that's not how it was in the beginning. God didn't create things in that way. And so we have to understand why does God even include giving and what's the benefit? And so this is where this question comes from. Does God want my money? And the answer is very simple. No, he doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. So Matthew 621 says this, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let that marinate for a second. Where you put your money, where you put your treasures, that is also where your heart is. So if you just think about that simply and practically, where you determine has value that's what you put your energy into. That's what your thought life goes into. That's what your resources go into. That's where your energy, your focus goes into. You don't believe it? It's real, it's real easy to see. Look at anybody. You say, what do people do every day? They go to work. Why do they go to work? I need my money. Why do you need money? I got to pay my bills. What bills you got to pay? I got to pay rent or mortgage. I got to pay for car. I got to pay insurance. I got to pay for food. I got to pay for light bill, for water bill. I got to pay for internet. I got to pay for cell phones. I got to pay for, for life insurance. I got to pay doctor's bills. I got to pay for all of these different things, college loans. I got to pay for all of this stuff. And the only way I'm going to pay for it is to work. So what do you do? You put your heart into what you do. Most of you sign up to a job and every day without fail, you're there because your performance there is going to be what helps you get that check. 
And what helps you get that check? When you get that check, you're going to be able to take care of all of the necessities in your life. So all of your treasures is locked in with your heart. That's why most people work at least 40 hours a week. Some people even more. I work 50, 60 hours a week sometime. Why? Because I had to work like that because I have to provide. I have to be able to take care of things that I have here, right? That's the thought process. So where my treasure is, that's where my heart is. The things that I care about, I care about them. What does that call for me? That calls for me obedience. You know what? My job has my heart. They have a portion of my heart. When I don't feel good, I'll still go to work. When I'm not doing uh, uh, the best, when I may be frustrated or confused, I still go to work. When I don't like what they give me in rules and regulations or job functions, I still go to work. I still perform. Why? Because I see it as a necessity, right? So whatever you see as a necessity, that's what you're going to give yourself to. That's where your treasury is. Now, I said all of that to say that your heart posture is makes all the difference. If somebody typically can be successful in their, in their line of work or in their job or whenever they do, it's because they have a passion for it, a love for it. Have you ever seen somebody who loves playing sports, play basketball, football, right? You do more with it when you have a love for it. I loved football. That was my favorite sport. I like basketball too now, but I loved football. And because I loved it, I was willing to put my body through pain. I was willing to put my body through sacrifices. I was willing to work hard. I was willing to work more. I would get up early to go do a morning workout because I wanted to be better in that sport. I would work, I would cut my summer vacation in half. And instead of spending my summer vacation off and maybe going to see my father and going to see other sides of the family and that kind of thing, I would spend that time at home just so I could make sure I was ready for practice on first day of practice. I would do two a days, three a day workouts. I would be so hurting that I couldn't walk the next day. I remember in 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 uh in college having walking down the steps and my legs are locked. My thighs are locked. I can't even get down the steps. I'd rather fall down the steps because I've overworked my muscles so much. I remember that. Why? Because when you love something, you will put whatever you need to put on the line in order to see that thing come to fruition. Why? It's important to you. It just is something that's important to you. You can always tell what somebody loves by what they put their heart into. I put my heart in the ministry because I love ministry. It is a passion that I have. And because of that, I put my heart into it. That's how you know if you actually love something. Watch what somebody, don't, don't listen to what they say. They can tell you they love it. But if they really love it, you'll see them do it. James says it this way. He says, you tell me you got faith. I'll tell you, watch the works. The works will show the faith that they have. Long story short, real simple. If you really love it, if it's really something that's in your heart, your actions are going to follow. So why are you saying all of this, A.B.? I'm saying all of it because this has to do with giving as well. And so I'm not here to tell you that you are required by God to give. That's not what the requirement is. It's not even a task that he's making you do. But your heart posture should be in a position where you actually want to do it. You want to give. You want to do what you can do for God. Why? Because you love him. And that should be your passion. That should be something that you're passionate about. And I'm here to tell you, and I'm here to check you also. If you don't have a passion for giving, ask yourself why. It's no problem with doing that. Because what you will typically find is areas of misunderstanding that you don't understand, things that you're missing. There's two reasons why people perish. Lack of knowledge and rejected knowledge. I guarantee you that if you have a problem with giving and you're not, you don't find it uh, uh, something that you want to do and you're not passionate about, I guarantee you it's going to be because of those two reasons. One of those two reasons, either you're going to lack knowledge on the subject or you're going to be found rejecting knowledge on the subject. 
Now, there could be a lot of different reasons why you're rejecting knowledge. Typically, there's only a couple of reasons why we lack knowledge. Normally, we lack knowledge because we it hasn't been revealed to us. Nobody's ever put that out in that kind of way. I'd say when I was giving you the history of how it was for me when I was in church coming up, I lack knowledge, not because I didn't have a Bible, but because the people who were teaching that Bible, they never gave it to me that way. They hit me with, I'm cursed with a curse if I don't give. That's what they hit me with. They hit me with the legalist law approach. Oh, and it worked. It worked. I gave. I tithe to the penny. If I found a dime on the ground, I was saying I at least have to give a penny in offering to add to that dime that I found because that was 10 cent I just found on the ground. Oh, it was that serious. It was that serious. But the fact of the matter is, is that out of my giving, I was giving out of compulsion. I was doing like what Jesus said to, to the Pharisees. He said, you tithe and you give offering to the mint. He was saying that you will even separate your spices to ensure that you give a little bit. But he said, the problem is you're, hip you, you're hypocrites and you're leading people closer to hell than to heaven. So it's a possibility that you could be doing an action, but it not be something that's connected to your heart in the way of the right heart posture. And so, again, the question and the check is, can you answer that question? Why am I not giving? Why do I not like giving? Nine times out of 10, you're going to find a lack of knowledge or rejected knowledge on the subject. Here's the good news. I'm here. So if you lack knowledge on the subject, guess what? I'm going to help clear that up for you. We can go into some scriptures and I can show you what God's intention is for you to give. In fact, let's go to one Bible story that I know most people know already. You didn't have to be a Bible scholar to get this one. You could just go a couple of days to vacation Bible school in the summer. Your grandma sent you over there and made you go. And somebody will probably talk about this. So let's talk about one of the first uh, stories in the Bible that talks about giving. And I love to go to this. And this is Genesis chapter four. And this is the story of Cain and Abel. It's a historic account of what God did in communication with the first family. Now, Cain was the eldest brother of Adam and Eve. Abel was the younger brother of Adam and Eve. Okay. So when time came around, there was a, a, a specific season or a time frame where they would give to God. They would give offering, okay? Now, the, the important thing about this is this is before the law was ever put on the earth, okay? So I want you to understand, this was before law. So this predated the law, okay? Some people say you don't have to give because that was a legal transaction and you don't have to do it. I'm saying you don't have to give because God doesn't require you to give. He doesn't. But he encourages you to do something that's good for you. And my point of view in this is to help you see how giving is actually good for you. Now, remember, we're going to talk about where you give and how you give and what you give. We're going to have all of those discussions because I can't just give you the fact that it's good for you to give. Because if I give you that information, but you give to the wrong place, you're still or you give in the wrong spirit, you're still not doing it right. OK, so it's important for me that your giving be effective. It be effective for you. It be effective for the church or the community of believers as a whole. And it be effective for the kingdom of God, because that's the only purpose of finances. Really, that's what it's for. It's really just for the purposes of furthering the kingdom. If you've got money and it's not for that, you're misappropriating the money. What do I mean by that? Am I saying that you should just be, you know, constantly taking your whole check and giving it out to a whole bunch of televisions? No, that's not what I'm saying, because that doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're further in the ministry. There's a lot of different pieces of that. Further in the ministry could be for you to have a home. The Bible says where the soles of your feet should tread upon shall belong to you. It's hard for it to belong to you if you've got to pay a bank for it. So further in the kingdom is actually having ownership of your own home. Isn't that a novel idea? So God cares that you own land. 
Yeah, he cares about that. Why? Because if you own land and others own land, that land could be used to be a benefit to the kingdom of God. It's just that simple, right? It's important for you to be able to travel. I think God wants you to be able to be mobile. I believe that he wants you to be able to go from one place to the other in the best way possible. Now, of course, you could walk. I mean, people serve God walking for years. People rode camels. People rode donkeys. <laughs> they did whatever, right? I'm not suggesting that you go out there and get a donkey. I'm not suggesting that you go hop on a camel's back. But if that's what you got to do, do it. But the point is, is that, yeah, I think God wants you to be mobile. So if that means that you need a car, I think God is for that. And I think that is blessing. And that could be a blessing for the kingdom, not just for you personally, but for the kingdom of God. Because you getting around is a benefit to the kingdom. Okay. So we'll talk about all of those different areas of giving and how all of those things are important. I'm not going to highlight and say this one area is the most important area where you have to give. See, and this is the problem because we've been taught to only give to the church. We've been taught that the Bible says that you're giving so there will be meat in my house. And I know they said that that was God saying it, but where you heard it, if you heard it like I heard it, it was like that pastor was saying it. And the funny thing was that pastor only fellowship with certain churches, but other churches they were enemies of. So that money didn't benefit those enemy churches. It only benefited the pastor and whoever in that congregation was connected to, right? If it benefited them, possibly, right? So I'm challenging the thought process for the right reason, though. The truth about it is if we start from the if we start from Genesis, we should understand how this thing should happen. So let's go to that story. Let's talk about the story. All right. And so the story in Genesis, if you go to Genesis chapter four, I would say read from verse three to verse seven, and it'll give you a good understanding. But I'll give you the basics of it. What it basically boiled down to is Cain was there to give. All right. So Cain said, I'm going to give. Cain worked the land, so he gave from the fruit of the land. Abel had flocks, so he gave from his flocks. So the Bible says this. The Bible says Cain's offering was not accepted. It was not accepted. It didn't please God. But Abel's offering pleased God. And so me, I ask questions. I'm reading this and I'm like, wait a minute. Both of them gave. Cain gave first. Then Abel gave. Why did you reject Cain's gift and you took Abel's gift? You know, and then some people who get all deep and spiritual, they try to they try to uh, uh, exegete from the text uh, or pull out from the text that the the reason why Cain's offering wasn't acceptable was because he gave it from the earth and God had cursed the earth. Um, this was a, a response to Adam and Eve falling. And because they fail, they were removed from the garden and that God cursed the earth and, and all of these things. But that's not true. That's not, you can't exegete that from the text effectively because the scripture doesn't say that's the reason why God rejected the offer. OK, so it wasn't just that he gave from that, because if that's the case, that was what he had to do. And you think about it. Think about God being a good father. How unfair would that be to God to curse the ground? And then if you give him an offering out of that ground, he say, I ain't going to accept it. Now, he cursed the ground. It wasn't Cain's fault. Cain didn't do any sin to make that happen. So it wouldn't have been on Cain. So it's just said, well, man, I, I'm a tiller of the ground. That's what I do. I do farms. I farm. That's what I do. My brother handles the livestock. I handle the farm. So it wouldn't be fair if God did that. So God didn't do that. Okay, be clear. That wasn't God's doing. That wasn't what he did. All right. He did not do that as a response to the ground being cursed. That wasn't it. So I asked, I said, well, what, what is it, God? And so I had to get into the discussion to understand what God said to Cain. So Cain was angry. And Cain was immediately angry because he recognized that his offering wasn't accepted and that Cain, uh, that Abel's was. And so I had to think about that for a little bit and just kind of think through and meditate on the thought process. And I thought about myself. 
And when I'm giving out of the right place of the heart, I'm not looking for a reward. Have you ever given to somebody and you just gave it out of the goodness of your heart? And so even if the person doesn't necessarily say thank you, it's okay because you didn't give it to them for the thank you. Have you ever been that? I've been that way. I've been that way where I felt like God led me to do something and I just did it. And I wasn't looking for a response. I just did it. I did it out of love. I did it out of obedience to God. And it was something that I wanted to do. And so I just did it. And the person may not have even acknowledged it, but I didn't take it. I didn't take it to heart. I wasn't angry. I wasn't upset because I didn't do it for that reason. I did it to be a blessing. And because I did it to be a blessing, whether they received it or not, wasn't my responsibility. My responsibility was to do it out of my heart. So this is what it showed me. It showed me a heart posture. Cain was upset, not because he didn't give, but because he was expecting because of his gift to get a reward of that pleased me. And when it didn't happen, his heart grew angry, so angry that he went and killed his brother after he spoke and talked junk to God. Basically, he caught an attitude with God. This tells you how intimate they were, you know. And so here's God being all powerful, all knowing, you know, the creator of all things. But here's Cain expressing his displeasure with the fact in a way of his countenance falling. You know how your kids do you? If you got kids, how your children do you whenever they're not really happy, they don't want to say nothing to be disrespectful, but you see it in their body language. So what they do, they pout, you know, they ball their face up. You tell them to clean their room and they look at you funny. Clean my room, man. Get out my face. You know, what'd you say? Um, nothing, nothing. They try to clear it up, you know, because they don't want to be disrespectful openly because if they're openly disrespectful, then you can execute punishment at that point. But they'll give it to you in, in their body language. Well, this is what happened. Cain's countenance, his body language fell. He was really disgusted by that. You know, I've been in this situation before. Let me just give you a transparent moment. It's when I gave something and I put myself into it and didn't get from it what I thought I should get from it. I got in my feelings. I was kind of aggravated. I was upset. And you know what that shine light on? It shine light on my reason for giving it. Because if I would have given it out of a different place in my heart, I wouldn't have felt some type of way when I didn't get the response that I expected. The Bible calls that hypocrisy. And, in, and it actually says in, in Matthew, it talks about this when it talks about prayer and giving alms. It says if you do it to be seen or accepted by men, then you've already received your reward. In other words, don't expect anything from God because you didn't do it for God. You did it to be seen. And since you did it to be seen, that's your reward. If you want to cash anything, that's what you get. And you know what happens when we give into an environment for compulsory reasons or to be seen? You know, the big thing that happens in church when people go up and they only give because they're either afraid that if they don't give, the people around them will feel some type of way and will judge them or they do it in order to be seen so that they can be judged highly or thought highly of because they gave. You know, it happens on both sides of that of, of, of that coin, but it's two sides to the same coin. It's hypocrisy either way. And guess what their reward is? Just that. That person can't be blessed by God because they're giving out of the wrong attitude. Cain gave out of the wrong attitude. And so God just has a frank conversation. I love God because he's such a personal God. He talks to us right where we are. And he has a frank conversation. He doesn't punk down. He doesn't sugarcoat it. And so the first thing he says is, Cain, why are you upset? Why are you acting testy, bro? Why are you acting like a punk? <laughs> this, how, this is how we hit it with it. You know, this is me. I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying that. I ain't going to say God said it. I'm going to say I said that. You know, Cain, why are you, why are you punking out, bro? Why are you acting like a chump, man? You know what I'm saying? 
You acting like you got a skirt on right now, player. <laughs> I would be mean. <laughs> Thank God I'm not God, right? Because I would, I would be, I would be pumpkin cake. What? What? I know you didn't. I done gave you life, and this is how you respond. No. But what he was saying was, Cain, why is your countenance falling? Why are you upset? Why are you aggravated? Why you seem to be bothered? If you hadn't done good, what did he mean by doing good? Cain did good. The action of giving appears to be good, right? How he gave. His heart was wrong. So he said, if you hadn't done good, if you had did it with the right purpose of heart, I would have been pleased with it. I'm not a respecter of person. I don't like Abel any more than I like you. I love both of you two equally. I love you both. Y'all are both my creation. I love you. What was he saying? He was saying you gave out of the wrong place. And instead of Cain receiving that check, receiving that counsel and that rebuke and turning it around and saying, you know what? You're right. I need to give to you better. Instead, he chose to act out and kill his brother. Listen, at the root cause of envy, at the root cause of strife, you're going to find self-centeredness every time. He was so prideful that instead of him just taking what he did and reaping what he reaped and doing better, he was ready to take out somebody else. You got to watch that. And so out of that sickness, out of that disgusting heart, he ended up killing his brother. And then he tried to hide it, buried him in the earth. This is what's happening. But this helps us understand this is the first context of giving to God. This is the first context of giving to God. Will a man rob God? Yea, he have robbed me wearing tithing and offering. It's the thought process. It's the heart posture. It's not about the amount. What I love about these scriptures is it never gives a, a nominal amount. It never gives a percentage of what they brought. So we can't use this to say Abel gave a tenth and Cain only gave a four, uh, uh, um, um, he only gave um, 5%. We can't say that because we have no way of knowing that. We can't say that, that Abel's offering was a huge amount. We can't say that Abel gave, you know, all these different types of animals and Cain, Cain only gave, you know, one type of fruit. We, we can't say that. There is no information to support that. So all we can go off of is what's been presented and that's the heart posture. So does God want my money? Uh -uh. He wants your heart. That's what he wants. Let's go to another section. This reminds me of another story. Let's go to the New Testament now. Let's move up to the New Testament and let's go in the, in the book of Mark. There's two occurrences where Jesus observes this. Uh, two writers write on it. Mark writes on it and also Luke wrote on, on, on the conversation. And so this is the situation where Jesus was sitting in the temple. He was sitting in the temple and he was sitting across from the treasury. And so the treasury is like the offering table. It's like where they take up the money. Okay. And so they had the, the offering table where they're taking up the money. And so Jesus is watching them take up the money and he's observing how they take up the money and he's observing how they give. And so he's watching and the scribes and the Pharisees are coming in. They're giving huge lump sums like, boom, like, you know, just think about it in our time. Somebody come in, throw down a hundred. Somebody come in, throw down a stack. You know what I'm saying? Somebody come in, throw down two stacks. They're like, boom. And it's like all of this money is going into the church. And so you would think that the people who gave a hundred, hey, they heart was after God. The people who gave a thousand, they heart was after God. The people who gave 2000, they heart was after God. Does this make sense? Have you seen this happen before? I remember I used to watch TBN. And I used to hate watching the telethon because they always had like telethon pieces where they were always raising money. 
And the thing that I hated about them raising money was not that they had need of money, but the way that they got their first satellite was by faith. And what they did was they ran it out for everybody to give into it. And they got a beautiful testimony about that. So I'm not saying that God didn't do it, right? TBN started out, they went out on faith. They, they This was a new thing. This was not something that was happening. There were not Christian broadcasting networks at the time. And they didn't have places that had like a satellite for that, where they can promote and put into everybody's home for free a, a station of gospel, of the tr of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That wasn't something that was d being done at the time. And so it's an awesome testimony. I love the testimony. I listened to it and I've given to TBN. So don't get me wrong. I've actually given to uh, uh, Trinity Broadcast Network. I've given to them um, in times past, right? I don't give to them now. I'm not going to lie. I don't. But I have in times past, and I'm not going to say I wouldn't, I would never do that again. I'm just saying that God led me away from it, I believe, personally. But the thing that I used to hate is that it was always a telethon. It was always a way over the TV to raise money. And so that's how they started the network. So they would have preachers come up. They would have people come up and speak. They would have people, they would have choirs come up and sing and give great entertainment and singing to people and encouraging people. And then they would ask for all of those people to dial in and give. And so they had the number at the bottom and they would encourage to give. The preachers would come in and they would encourage everybody to give. And so it was like, everybody just, just give, just give, just give. And so by the end of this night, they had enough money to be able to take care of the satellite and to basically establish with the number of viewers that they had, that they had a right to be on television, right? And that it was a good thing. And so basically that's what they did. But in order to sustain it and co to continue growth, they made this a normal practice. And so here we are 50, 60 years after, the, after it started and they're still doing the same thing. And, you know, it reminded me of the little church that had the building fund and that you never seen nothing built in that church. You ever been to the little church that had the building fund and they had they had the, the picture of the church and the thermometer. You remember the thermometer and marker and it had the little red line at the bottom with the little with the little the little bulb of the thermometer at the very bottom of the little bulb at the bottom and it was a little red line and they be coloring it in and they tell you how much you gave and they got the amounts on the side and then they got it going to the top because this is going to get us a new church when we get this amount of giving filled up and you know you've been there and 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 5 years go by and that mark that marker don't never seem to be moving up and, and 10 years go by and that marker, that red is just, I'm, I don't, I don't know what house this is in, but if, if, if my temperature don't ever go up, if I can't control it with my thermostat, I'm, I, something got to be fixed or I'm moving. And this is, this is the actual thought process that, that it, it compared to me. It brought to me when I looked at TBN, they were always raising money, but it, it was not as easy to see what was coming from that money. Now, they did great jobs in spreading and, and, and getting new stations and, and getting on more people's airwaves and all of these things, but the ends never seemed to justify the means. As much money as they were bringing in, which we never had a total on, we saw so much more of what was going out. And then it became such a high commodity for pastors and, and choirs and, and all of these people to get famous in the church realm was to get on TBN. And so pastors and leaders started giving by the troves just so they can get on, on the broadcast. And we didn't even know that they were paying for their broadcast to be aired on the, on, on the network. And I think that's still a practice that goes on today, but we don't ever see the bottom line, but they're, always taking money in and it's like everything is an infomercial everything is a commercial trying to sell you some holy water or or, or a, a prayer cloth or or this and it's all for your love gift of and so all of this is just coming into it so that builds up this mentality of i'm giving but i'm giving into something and it's abuse it's abuse it's abuse and so here Let's go back to Jesus, who's sitting there watching the money changers. He's watching the people who are doing the money, and he's seeing people throw out money. I used to watch TBN, and they used to do the same thing. They used to say, they call out, 
Uh, Psalm 139. There's somebody in the, uh, there's somebody who's watching who's going to give $139 and sow $139 seed. Somebody else is going to sow $1,390. Somebody else is going to sow $13,900. Somebody else is going to sow $139,000. And they would keep going up. And so they would give you all of these figures. You know, the least, of course, was $139. They never started with a dollar. 39 cent right <laughs> the lease was going to be 139 you're going to at least come out a c note don't play with me and so that's the thought process they used to set it up that way so everybody is thinking i gotta give and so i remember i remember sitting there watching and hurting because i didn't have the enough money in my account to be one of those big time givers because who doesn't want to give to god big time and God shared with me this, this, this story of Jesus. Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. You can also go into Luke, I think it's chapter 21, verses one through four. Both of them, same story. Jesus is watching. And so as he's watching all these people throw these big bills out and give all of these money, they're giving a thousand, they're giving a thousand, they're giving a thousand, three, three hundred ninety dollars They're giving uh, 13, they're giving all of that amount, right? And so Jesus is watching them as they give. And here a woman comes up and she gives what's called two mites. The worth of two mites is a penny. So she gave two little copper coins that equaled a penny. So one of the copper coins was half a penny. The other copper coin was like half a penny worth. She gave two little copper coins that equaled a penny. Look at what Jesus says. He says, out of that two mites, she gave more than everybody else here. Because she gave out of her necessity. She gave out of her heart, out of her living. In other words, she's a poor lady. She doesn't have much resources. But she gave from a heart posture that said, I will give my last to just be a blessing in God's house. Now, here you've got all of these other big wigs who's throwing out all this money. I'll give you a perfect example of this, and I'm going to have to call some names, and people might hate on me for this, but I'm going to have to call it out. So a couple years back, there was this opportunity that Tyler Perry was sitting in uh, T.D. Jake's church, uh, and it was some type of conference I remember seeing when it happened. And I'm going to be specific and put these names out here, not to cast shade on Tyler Perry or on T.D. Jakes. I don't know either one of these people personally. I can't speak to their salvation. I can't speak, speak to their Christian walk at all. But I'm going to use this as an example because most of you, if you're like me, you remember it. And if you don't remember it, you can actually get on YouTube and look it up. Tyler Perry gives, I think it was like a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. I can't remember the exact amount. I think it might've been a meal um, to TD Jakes, right? Okay. And so this is at a church service. Okay. And he's sitting there and he writes out a check and the check is for a large amount. Now, a million dollars to a billionaire <laughs> ain't a lot of money. However, if I hold up a million dollar check and say that somebody in this room sitting beside you gave a million dollars, you know what that causes you to do? The first thing you're going to think is, man, I can't, they love God more than me. So what does that make you do? I'm going to give till it hurt. I'm going to give what I could give. You know what you're about to do? You're about to give out a pride. You're about to give out a compulsion. And as a leader, by promoting and putting that out, saying out loud the amount that somebody gave, what you're doing is you're causing others to envy what that person was able to give. And you are manipulating the people, regardless of whether you want to say so or not. You're manipulating the people to either try to match that goal or over that amount. And that's wrong. It's not God. This is what Jesus was saying. He said this lady gave more than the rest of them. Two mites, she gave more because she gave it out of a place of her heart. She wasn't giving it to be seen. She wasn't giving it so that people understood what that she had all of this money. She wasn't trying to shine and show off. 
She wasn't trying to get up there and make a spectacle of herself to make it seem like she was deep or spiritual or anything of the like. She was giving out of her need. She was giving out of necessity. In other words, not for what she could receive. She was giving based off of the fact, I just have a heart to want to give to you, God. I just love you. And I just want to give to you. I know I don't have much, but such as I have, I'm giving it to you, God. That was her heart posture. And it said this poor lady gave more than the rest of them. Now, back to this story with T.D. Jakes and uh, Tyler, your boy Tyler Perry. And so Tyler Perry shares with somebody that he's sitting close to. Of course, he's sitting in VIP sit seating up, up near the front, of course, because he's he's a billionaire. So he doesn't sit with the rest of regular parishioners. He sits up front somewhere, which is also in the Bible because it talks about how the Pharisees and the scribes, they set aside chief seats for people that's got money. They set you in a specific area because you got dough and because you're prominent. They say, you come sit up here with us. Because you've been accepted. You in the clique, you in the group. You understand? And so at a lot of these mega ministries, they have executive seating. They have seating for those big wigs. They have seating for the celebrities that come because that's a big draw. You understand if the celebrities are coming, people want to see the celebrities there, then of course they want to go, right? Because that's how the culture operates. It's a whole different lesson. That's a whole different story. We'll get it on, the, on that at another time. But the truth is, this is what was going on. So Tyler was sitting in the area where nobody else was sitting around him. And he was able to say to one of the big wigs that was sitting up there by him that he felt led that the Lord spoke to him to give a million dollars. Now, I don't know Tyler Perry's net worth. And I think, I, I hope I'm speaking right. If I'm off by any amount, guys, forgive me and go do the research yourself. It is all online. It's a video of it actually happening. So the amount he says out of his mouth, okay? And so th this is a part of what happened. So if it's not a million dollars, it was a large amount of money. It was a huge amount of money. I think it was a meal. But um, if it's not, then, you know, don't hold it against me. I, I, I don't know the exact amount, okay? But it's it, I think it's somewhere around a meal, okay? But I don't know his net worth. I don't, I don't research the man's net worth, but I know if I'm not mistaken, he's a billionaire. Okay. And so it's in the billions and I don't think it's low on the billion. I think it's up there on the billion. I know he owns a lot of assets. He has a lot of businesses and I'm not saying that Tyler Perry doesn't do things for people and all of that stuff. I don't know this man. I do not know him. I'm talking about a circumstance that is something that people can probably recognize that kind of communicates the same truth. So he get, he says that to somebody sitting by him. The word gets back to Bishop. And so Bishop, standing in front of the whole audience, announces or actually calls Tyler Perry up to announce what God told him. So instead of him telling himself, this man gave us a million dollars, he said, here, you come up here and you take you you get a chance to speak at my platform. Now, just so you're aware, a regular Joe Blow is not going to walk up in the Potter's house and get a chance to come to the stage and grab the mic, okay? That's typically not going to happen, all right? So for that to happen alone meant that, you know, it had to be something major. Now, I'm not going to say that that was because God made a way. I know the scriptures, your gift will make room for you and put you before great men. I, I know all of the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the truth that will be spit at me from all of the churchy folks that want to say, I'm judging TD Jakes and I'm judging, uh, <laughs> and I'm judging, um, uh, Tyler Perry. Listen, I, I don't have a heaven and hell to put either one of them in. I'm talking about a circumstance. So let's just be clear. He gets a, he gets up there. He grabs the mic from T.D. Jakes. And he announces, as would happen in normally in a local church, he announces, God told me. And then he says to give, I think it was a million dollars, uh, to write a check. He just told me, write a check for me. And the whole church goes up. Ah! Everybody screaming, and uh, Jake's is walking back and forth from being theatrical. I I love T D Jakes. Don't, don't get me wrong, I love this guy, but he is uh, he is definitely a character. 
And uh, so he's walking back and forth, being theatrical and everything and kind of using that to hype everybody up. And so everybody is getting hyped to give more. You got to think about it. This was like a it wasn't like a revival, but it was like a conference where they were going to come back again the next night and the next night and that kind of thing. So other people were going to have opportunities to step up and give. And so this was encouraging those kind of big gifts. You understand by putting this person on display and saying they gave this much money, people are looking at the dollar amount, a million dollars in an offering. Wow. That's what people are thinking. Wow. But Jesus just said. That ain't nothing. This woman out of giving me a penny gave me more than all of these big wigs were dropping in here. What does that say? That means we need to challenge our culture. The truth is that if Tyler Perry did give a million dollars out of billions, that ain't even scratching the surface. And him and T.D. Jakes have business relationships. They've done plays together. They've done movies together. That, that is a reciprocal relationship. In other words, if he sows it into T.D. Jakes, it's very possible that he's going to get something in return. Okay. It's very, very possible. All right. So with all of that being said, that is not a picture of the heart posture. How much you give is not a picture of your heart posture. So somebody giving hundreds, thousands of dollars, even millions, doesn't mean that they love God. Doesn't mean that they love God more. Doesn't mean that they're actually even, that their gift is even pleasing to God. It doesn't mean that God is going to say you did well. So I'm going to tell you, everybody in that church was on fire, falling out and all of this. In fact, Tyler goes on to start speaking in tongue and, 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 and call himself, um, prophesying to td jakes and and he he ends up it turns into this big ordeal and he ends up laying hands on td jakes and td jakes it falls out and all of this stuff <laughs> and okay i listen i give you my personal opinion i think it's a, a load of mess i think it was all for, for the cameras and for show i don't believe none of it but with that being said i can't say i do not know these people you understand what i'm saying i can't say that that wasn't authentically them. Okay. What I will say is that I just, it don't move me. And honestly speaking, if, if I had to judge how Jesus judged this situation, it didn't move him. Jesus does not care about the dollar amount. I want you to get this in your head. He doesn't need your money. He doesn't care about the dollar amount as much as he cares about the heart posture. All right. Let me draw your attention to something else. These other people were giving these large amounts. This this for them may have been tithe and offering. OK, the idea of the tithe is a tenth. That's the re that's the reason why it gets the name tithe. The idea of the tithe is a tenth. OK, and an offering can be over that. Right. And so this woman gave two mites, but Jesus said. It was out of all she had. In other words, her percentage would have been way more than a tenth. Because those two mites for her being poor could have been 80, 70, 90 percent of her overall income. That could have been the majority of her income. So what are you saying, man? I'm saying this. When you're giving from the heart, you're not focused on a percentage. When you're giving from the heart, you're not focused on a percentage. And if you're not focused on a percentage, then you're not doing it just to be received. You're doing it because God is laying it on your heart to do. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to share this with you. And then uh, I'm going to wrap for this session and we'll go on to another session and we'll go into some of this a little more. Okay. But this is the honest to God truth. For a long period of my life in my Christian walk, I paid tithes and I paid it as a debt. I just be honest with you. It didn't initiate that way when I started giving my tithes and offering. I did feel a compulsion to do it because I was taught that that's what you should do. And so when I got saved and I, I, I was gloriously saved and God really came into my heart and I knew it was God, I wanted to give. 
So I was happy and excited to give my tithes. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't go to church every Sunday because of the schedule that I worked on my job. But what I would do is when I got my check, I would pull out my tenth at the top of first thing as soon as I got my check and I would put it in my Bible. And so when I would go to church, I would go to church and I would give that amount. And so I remember it was like uh, I could go to church like once or twice a month on Sundays um, because of how I worked. And when I would go, I would, you know, give my accumulation of what I had. And they were looking at me like, you know, because I'm putting this much paper, this much cash into the uh, into the offering. And, and, you know, and I didn't do it in an envelope. I didn't write my name on it. I didn't put the actual amount in there because I wasn't thinking about calculating. I was actually thinking giving this to God. And so I was like, God can count. <laughs> he don't need to know my amount. And, you know, and I really wasn't even thinking about them looking at my money. I would fold it up in my hand and just drop it in the thing. And at the time I looked a little hood. So I probably, I was just coming out of the world and I kind of still had some of that, that drug dealer look on me. I had some of that hood look on me. And because I had some of that look on me, they probably was thinking in their mind, Oh, this, this, this dude is getting this out of the trap and bringing it to the church, you know, but of course they wouldn't reject me because of that. You know, I'm going to tell you some of the friends of pastors today are drug dealers. Drug dealers are some of the local pastor's best friends, because honestly speaking, if you bring in that dough, they don't care what you do. Real talk. As long as you don't get caught in the church with it, you know what I'm saying? As long as you don't bring no bo no bro bother to the church, they good with it. Bring me your money. I've heard preachers talk about it, you know, dope deals and everything like that. And do bringing, you know, uh, you know, G's bringing stacks in church, you know, and, and don't donating it to the house of the Lord and, and, you know, and them receiving it. So <clears throat> I said all of that to say, they probably, they, they received me regardless because I was given, but in my mind, my heart, I really wasn't given from a standpoint of so much compulsion where I thought I was doing it to be seen. That wasn't what it was for me, but it was that I thought that God would be angry if I didn't do it. And I, I, I didn't want him to be angry. I wanted to be pleasing because I loved him. And so to be pleasing, I was complying and being obedient. Okay. And so I won't say necessarily initially that it was rejected knowledge. I think it was more of a lack of knowledge, but I was given to the 10. Then as I continued on, it got more rigorous. The more I heard about giving, I was hearing all of these messages and it sounded like it was like, no, you have to do this. And if you don't do this, you're cursed with a curse and all of this. And so after a while of hearing that, you get real dogmatic about how you do things. And so I would be calculating when I calculated my bills, I would calculate my tithes. And so just in calculation alone, I was doing it like it was a bill. I got to pay God this amount. And then I got to pay this amount for my place. I got to pay this amount for my car. I got to pay this amount for my insurance. I got to pay this. So this is how I was thinking. And so then I would say what I got left, you know? And then after I got to what I had left for the next week or the next couple of weeks till I got my next check, I would be sad, frustrated, and angry because I'd be like, man, I got to pay all this stuff, man. I ain't going to have no money. You know, after I get gas, <laughs> I ain't got no money but just to go to work. Give me some bologna or something, some, some, some hot dogs. And so this was the thought process that I had, okay? So I did that. I did that for years. I want you to understand I did that for years. And as I continued to learn more about giving and God's grace and the things like that, there were certain times where I might have been given cheerfully, but there were other times where I was given grudgingly. And it's just the truth of I was giving grudgingly. And so eventually God got me to the place where he started actually teaching me about giving. And that's when he took me to the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, we're going to talk about this more next time. Take a break. We're going to talk about this more the next time. But I want you to understand is what I figured out is what God ended up showing me was that by me giving on what was laid on my heart, not grudgingly, by that happening, that was something that I was able to see after I did my taxes at the end of the year, I found that I had actually 
given somewhere north of 25 to 35% that year versus previous years of just giving a 10th because I just gave out from my heart. Whatever God number dropped in my heart, whatever, and I would get up and do it in a ritual form. I would get up, I would praise God, I would worship God, I would enjoy Jesus, I would, I would, I would sing, I would worship, I would even sometimes speak in tongue. I would get scriptures in my head, I would go through scriptures, and then when I would get on, uh, um, I, I used to give uh, through through the computer uh, to my church, and I would just do it as soon as I got my check, so I wouldn't have to worry about it on that Sunday. And so as soon as I would sit down to give. I, I just felt so joyous and happy. And I would just say, God, what do you want me to give? And whatever number I felt that was dropped in my head, in my heart, that's what I would do. I would give that amount. And I would give the amount and I would put a little scripture with it. And I would like send that amount with an assignment, you know, believe in God and just giving off, off, off of my heart. And I was happy about giving because the church that I was going to, I felt was great ground. It was ministering to my community. It was ministering to my family. It was ministering to everything that I had going on. And so I was like, yo, this is beautiful. And guess what? I didn't just give to my church. I gave to other ministries that I was connected with and other people. And I would give on my job and I would give to people. I would raise offerings for people at work who were going through things. And I would, I would give, I would be the first give person to give. I would look for opportunities to give. When, when, when we were leaving our check, we would go eat somewhere. I would be thinking about what can I give this waiter, this waitress to be a blessing? Like I was always seeking God's face for other opportunities to give. And that changed about me. I didn't know how good it felt to give and to give cheerfully until that time in my life. And I had been saved for years. I had been in church for at that time over 10 years. And I was just learning how to give. And so what we're going to do the next time is we're going to talk about how to give. We're going to talk about how to give. And we're going to get into this scripture and we're going to go to second Corinthians chapter nine. And we're going to look at chapter nine and we're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about giving sparingly. We're going to talk about giving and, uh, and reaping sparingly. We're going to talk about giving abundantly and reaping abundantly. Okay. We're going to talk about that. Thank you for your time. Listen, this has come to you straight from Promise Seed Ministries. It's something that we're doing, man. You are a child of the promise. If you ever doubted that, if you ever doubted that, let me tell you right now, you are a child of the promise. Jesus was the promised seed of Abraham. He was the promised seed of Abraham, not Isaac. He was. And the Bible says by faith that he would be the first of many brethren. You have an opportunity, if you're not yet, to be the promised seed to be the child of the promise. And that means that all of the benefits that God promised is coming to you. I hope you're blessed. If you need me, reach out to me. I promise you, we're going to make sure we provide you with all our ways of communication so you can get up with us. Anything you're praying for, anything you want to hear about or know about, let me know. We're going to be more than happy to go into that for you. God bless you. I pray that in all of your getting, you continue to get an understanding and you continue to get the word in your heart. And listen, Salvation is the gift that keeps on giving. Spread it around. God bless.